Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tech Talk session number 49. I'm Paul Stetchik with NEPSI. Today, we will be talking about superconducting fault current limiter solutions. Um, and um, t with us today, we have Michael Ross from American Superconductor and also Arnold, Arnold Ale from Nexens. Uh, don't forget today, uh, you will be eligible for PDH uh, contact hours. You can e either email myself, paul.stedgick at nipsey.com or Matt Marset uh, to receive that uh, PDH certificate. Um, so, uh, and also don't forget to ask questions at any time. We will wait to the end of the presentation to answer those questions, but please in the chat box, um, please uh, ask your questions as we move along in the presentation. Uh, so uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Welcome to uh, our Tech Talk number 49. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, talk to your audience. Uh, just uh, briefly uh, about uh, American Superconductor, uh, AMSC is uh, headquartered uh, just outside of Boston in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, this company's been around since about 1987, uh, shortly after the discovery of uh, the type of superconductors that we're going to talk about today. Uh, our company is public, uh, traded on the NASDAQ under the ticker uh, AMSC. Uh, our company has uh, head, uh, sales and service uh, all over the world, North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. And in addition to our uh, superconductor technologies, uh, AMSC is heavily involved in the um, power sector. Uh, we're very involved in uh, uh, wind energy, uh, wind turbine design, and uh, uh, supply of components, as well as transmission and distribution uh, solutions of, of various types. Uh, however, today we're gonna focus on, uh, on superconductors. Um, so just very briefly, uh, what is a, uh, a superconductor? So most people are familiar with superconductors in that uh, they're aware that it's a material that can move current with zero resistance. Um, so it's the, uh, this uh, special material, uh, unlike copper or aluminum or other conductors that we use in the utility sector, uh, superconductors when in the correct state uh, can move current with absolutely zero resistance, which means zero losses. And it also means that uh, because we can move current with, uh, with zero losses, the cross section of the material is very narrow. So the, the, the uh, current density uh, of the material is very, very high. In the uh, top right hand corner of the screen here, uh, you can see a comparison between some of the superconductor material that we, we make here in Massachusetts uh, and uh, the equivalent to current carrying uh, material that you would need in copper. So that little handful of, uh, of superconductor wires can carry the same amount of current as all of that copper. So we, uh, we use this technology in, uh, in a variety of products, uh, cables and, and, and other things, uh, to try to move large amounts of current uh, in a very small space. Um, however, uh, the material has a very unique characteristic uh, that we take advantage of uh, to develop products like this uh, fault current limiter device that we're going to talk about today. And that characteristic is represented in the uh, bottom right hand corner. Uh, so with the uh, superconductor material, it can carry a lot of current with no resistance, but it can't carry infinite current uh, with no resistance. There's a limit to how much current we can pass through the material before it stops being superconducted. And this uh, figure in the, in the bottom right hand corner is representing that um, as the uh, current increases uh, through the material, the, uh, the voltage across the material, or another way of saying that the resistance is, uh, is zero uh, until you get to a certain point and then the, uh, and then the resistance becomes very large. Uh, we call that, that uh, characteristic uh, quenching, um, which means that the, the superconductor transitions from being a very low resistance to a high resistance. And it's just a, a physical property of the material. It, it just happens uh, uh, as part of the, the, the way the material works. Um, so what that means in terms of uh, fault current limiting is that if we make a product um, like a fault current limiting device uh, out of the superconductor material, it uh, can pass current uh, through the device with zero resistance. So it essentially doesn't look like anything's there. And then when there's a fault on the system and you have fault currents uh, passing through the device, it will instantaneously become resistive. And uh, that resistance will then limit the amount of fault current 
uh, flowing through the device, which is uh, why we call it a fault current limiter. Uh, one, uh, and we'll talk quite a bit about the, the details of that in this presentation. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind is that uh, uh, superconductors do need to be kept cold. Um, so we do cool these devices and, and all superconducting devices with, uh, with various coolants. Uh, in this particular case, we use liquid nitrogen. Uh, liquid nitrogen is a wonderful material because 78% uh, of what we're breathing is uh, gaseous nitrogen in, in the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, when we liquefy that and turn it into a, a material for cooling, uh, it's uh, very inexpensive because it's so plentiful. And also, it's, it's absolutely uh, environmentally friendly and non-toxic. Uh, if you were to spill this coolant, it simply evaporates and, and becomes air. Uh, just a, a little bit more to, to uh, about the superconducting uh, material in order to understand how this product works. Uh, the, the material itself, uh, the superconducting material, is a, is a fairly uh, a brittle material. Uh, it's it, it's a, a sort of like a, a ceramic type material. And so uh, as we are making superconductor wire uh, out of this material, we had the same challenge that the fiber optic industry had it. How do you take a material that's inherently brittle, uh, glass in the, in the case of fiber optics and, and uh, like a, this uh, ceramic type uh, material in the case of superconductors, and turn that into um, a wire or a cable that can be bent and twisted and pulled and, and all the things that you need to do. Uh, in the fiber optic industry, uh, what they did is they took the glass and made it very thin to make fiber uh, optical fibers, and then they coat that material with uh, plastic in order to give it mechanical strength. So a typical fiber optic cable is a number of different uh, glass, very thin fibers coated with plastic to give it mechanical strength. In the superconductor world, it's, we did something very similar. We took this uh, superconductor material, uh, we make a, a very thin layer of it, and then we coat it with other metals. Uh, we can coat it with uh, copper, brass, or stainless steel. And those different metals have different levels of resistance. So when you look at a superconductor wire, what you're seeing is a, uh, is a, is a uh, product that has a thin layer of superconductor material surrounded by other metals that have uh, normal resistance. When you think about that in terms of a circuit, uh, the current flowing through the wire during normal operation, when the, uh, when the current is at uh, rated levels and the, the temperature on the system is at where it needs to be, uh, the current flows 100% in that zero resistance superconducting layer so you have no resistance uh, visible to the system. But then when there's a fault on the system and that superconducting layer becomes um, non-conducting, the current is then pushed into the other metals in the wire that have resistance. And so that's how we get this transition from zero resistance to high resistance uh, very, very quickly is because we essentially shut off the layer that has the superconductor and push the current into the other metals. Uh, so that's the kind of background of, uh, of the basic technology. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Arnaud, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, Nexans and the actual fault current limiting product that uh, Nexans manufactures from this uh, superconductor material. Uh, Arnaud? Thank you, Mike. So, uh, so Nexans is a, is a global leader uh, for cabling solution, so with a worldwide uh, footprint, with many domains of activity from building distribution to transmission, and also for a, a system for transport. So Nexans employs 25,000 people and with a, with a turnover of 5.7 billion. Um, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, 38 plants around the world and, and a commercial activity uh, worldwide. Nexons also, uh, since its creation is 2000, is involved, uh, deeply involved in the development and deployment of superconducting system. And we are now at a leading position uh, uh, in superconductor industry. Uh, so, and we are manufacture uh, uh, different type of, of uh, appliance, and also since uh, quite the beginning of, of our history, uh, uh, we are also collaborating uh, with uh, IMSC, for example, on various projects.
So uh, the main characteristic of full current limiter and the unique benefits is that uh, due to the um, zero resistance and also zero inductance, because we have also a, a, a design which uh, limits the inductance, uh, the system is in invisible to the grid. That means when you install it uh, in a rated condition, you, you, you have no uh, footprint, no impedance, so uh, you don't have to to change anything in a grid to, to introduce this uh, system. And the big benefit of, this, of it that it reduces the short circuits uh, and it allows indeed to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, the, uh, the protection uh, rating of the, of the equipment which are connected in series with such a system. So the main application is to enable grid coupling, which is one of the major source of uh, um, fall current increase in the life of a network. Uh, so it allows to simplify distributed generation as well, because this is another source of, uh, of uh, short circuit in, uh, increase. And by reducing fall current, you have also an indirect effect on the safety of people, because you have less uh, 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 voltage rates in the screen or in the earthing pass. And also, it is uh, compatible with unmanned operation because indeed you have a, a recovery after uh, after the fault. Uh, uh, the system is coming back in operation uh, after a few minutes. Next, please. So, uh, indeed, uh, uh, we are because we are drastically limiting the the, the fault current. We are limiting a lot, especially at the beginning of the fault, you have what we call a, a first peak, which is highly damageable for, uh, mm -hmm. because of the mechanical force, which uh, raise or uh, magnetic force. And it, it is, uh, it is uh, damaging, wearing a lot, breakers, ground, grounding equipment, transformer on cable indeed. So uh, uh, this introduction of such a system in a network uh, reduce or eliminate the need to upgrade circuit breaker and make their, uh, their life longer indeed. Uh, and also it prevents uh, uh, equipment uh, uh, to be damaged uh, um, uh, after, after, um, after putting operation the, the limiter. And indeed it eliminates the need to reinforce bus work because most of the time uh, it is when you are coming to the limit of the bus work if you want to avoid uh, the bus to, to indeed uh, uh, melt, because this is what will happen if we exceed the, the fall current, uh, fall current limiters are much appreci appreciated. Next one, please. So here we see the, indeed the different uh, um, time of, of the fall current, fall current limiter. So in normal operation, you see we are invisible to the grid and when the short circuit starts, then uh, um, we have this interesting, intrinsic uh, limitation coming from the superconducting material, which is switching from uh, 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 superconducting state to normal state. And it will push the current in the parallel resistive pass within uh, less than two milliseconds. So it's very fast. It, and it also, uh, as it is uh, uh, um, resistive for current limiter, uh, you have no uh, voltage increase. You are just increasing the impedance and this is very smooth. Uh, and we, we, you have nearly no voltage instability. And you are reducing as well the fault uh, energy during the fault. Huh? You see if you integrate the signal that uh, you are reducing dramatically the, indeed the, the energy uh, uh, dissipated during fault. And after a certain uh, time, so uh, when the uh, breaker is activated, so we have we have some minutes of recovery before we can reduce another time. So we, you can have after this re recovery another fault. The fault current limiter uh, came back to his uh, uh, initial initial temperature, and you you can you can uh, 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 come back to uh, to the initial state. So, and the only, uh, how to say, it is quite wear free. So, the only system to maintain is a, is a cooling system. Uh, you don't need any spare part on site. You don't need any action of operators. You just have to wait until it cools down. Um, and it 
and the, indeed the aim is, is not to limit uh, the, the, the full current to, to any level. Indeed, the customer is asking us to, uh, to keep a certain level of fault, just not to uh, uh, kind of shortcut the other protection in the system. So, uh, so we are indeed uh, uh, asked to, to stay in the windows, so to go below a certain level, but to stay at the level of, uh, of a current which allow the existing protection to trigger. That means to play their role in the rest of the network. Next, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Arnaud. Um, so, uh, after uh, now you understand a, a bit about how the all current works, uh, one of the things that uh, AMSC offers is to work with people that might have applications of this uh, technology uh, to study uh, those uh, applications and, and determine if the product uh, makes sense. Uh, so just to talk uh, uh, briefly about some of the key uh, applications uh, of the fault current limiters, uh, by far the most uh, common application where we, where we see a lot of interest from utilities is in this um, idea of uh, reducing fault current at distribution buses when there's a addition of a, of a transformer or other uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, you know, improvements to the grid that's increasing the system strength and the system fault current uh, to the point where, where fault current becomes a problem. Uh, there's two basic uh, locations uh, where we can install a fault current limiter to help with this issue. Uh, the, the most uh, uh, common place to look is in this uh, bus bar tie configuration. So if we were to install a fault current limiter uh, between two distribution buses within a substation, uh, what it's effectively doing is it's uh, limiting the fault current from one bus to, to uh, feeding faults on the other bus. Uh, so you, you have most of the benefits of opening a, or splitting a bus uh, by opening a bus tie breaker, uh, which is uh, you know something that utilities commonly do to try to manage fault current to start to split up their distribution systems. Uh, but you maintain all the advantages of keeping your bus tie together, uh, operationally, reliability, uh, redundancy, uh, all of the things that you that you benefit from keeping your buses tied together, you get to keep those benefits. Uh, but you avoid the big negative of keeping your buses tied together, which is um, uh, increased fault current. Uh, so the bus bar tie configuration is, is a very common uh, configuration that we study. Uh, the transformer tail configuration is also uh, of great interest, particularly when, when utilities are looking to add capacity or uh, redundancy to a substation by adding an additional transformer. Uh, and when you add additional transformer, you can increase the uh, the fault current at a bus uh, tremendously, 25, 30, uh, 30 in a lot of cases. You'll you'll see uh, uh, fault current increases uh, by installing a transformer in parallel. Uh, excuse me, in series with a fault current limiter, uh, you get all of the steady state capacity, the ability to serve load and, and serve more customers from that transformer. But you limit the uh, the amount of fault current. Uh, contributed by that transformer, even if the transformer is the same impedance as the other transformers that are already there. Uh, so th this is a, a, a way for utilities to be able to expand capacity while managing uh, fault current and, and avoiding having to do large scale breaker replacements and other uh, costly events. Uh, another application that we see is with uh, inter interconnection of renewables. Uh, so particularly large-scale renewables um, on and offshore wind or large-scale uh, solar plants, uh, those can have impacts on fault current as well. And uh, if that uh, addition of that plant causes uh, fault currents to exceed the, the rating of existing equipment where they want to be installed, uh, the cost to upgrade the grid can be rather substantial and, and in some cases make those uh, renewable developments no longer cost effective. So if, uh, if the renewable developer has to pay the utility uh, a large sum of money to upgrade their grid to deal with the fault current that they're going to contribute, uh, that can, can uh, make the projects uneconomical. Uh, so using fault current limiters uh, to try to limit the contribution of fault current to the grid by renewables 
uh, is a way to uh, increase the adoption of renewable technologies and uh, minimize the negative impacts of adding renewable uh, renewables to the grid. Uh, the third application is uh, related with uh, with conventional generation uh, systems. Um, it's it's uh, common for uh, industrial customers, in particular, like large steel plants, microchip manufacturers, other uh, large industrial companies to add generation uh, to their systems uh, in order to um, uh, offset the power that they're purchasing from the utility. It's a, a process that we call cogeneration. Uh, when the generator is added to a, to an industrial facility, that generator will contribute fault current to the system, uh, and that fault current could uh, that that addition could push the uh, fault current levels above where you, the uh, protection equipment is already. Uh, designed to be, uh, which could be very, very expensive and, and make the, uh, the project, uh, again, not feasible. So installing a generator in series with a, a fault current limiter, uh, you get all the benefits, uh, all the power uh, from the generator during the steady state, but you limit the, uh, the negative uh, of the fault current addition caused by that generator. Uh, in addition, um, large generators uh, are often uh, have uh, have arc flash issues. So so large generators, the auxiliary loads used to serve the uh, the controls and and protection and other functions of that generator are often served off of the uh, the main transformer uh, for that generator, uh, and those transformers can be quite large, resulting in very very high fault currents on the low voltage uh, auxiliary uh, buses. So it's a very, very common problem to have serious arc flash issues at generating plants. Uh, and uh, the utilities have uh, ways of dealing with that, uh, but the fault current limiter is, a, um, is an alternative to reduce the arc flash danger uh, at these generating facilities uh, so that you can uh, use less expensive equipment, smaller equipment, uh, have tighter clearances, uh, reduce, reduce the footprint of the facility and so on. Uh, so uh, safety is, is another uh, key application of the technology when it comes to reducing fault current and, uh, and arc flash danger. Uh, Arnaud had mentioned earlier uh, about uh, that the, the FCLs do require a cool down period. Um, and that is uh, something that we, we study and, and we work with our customers to, to understand uh, in the event that the FCL needs you know, has a has a limits the fault current. It does have this five minute or so cool down period, and that um, cool down period can cause some challenges. But uh, we we do have approaches to deal with that. Um, this uh, figure is trying to discuss that a bit. Um, so during uh, during normal operation, uh, current uh, is flowing through the fault current limiter, and uh, what we're trying to represent in this figure is in the top left you have the superconductor wire which if you think about it really consists of two different circuits. You have the superconductor layer with zero resistance, and then you have the other metals in the wire that have, uh, have some non-zero resistance. Uh, the way that we install the device is usually in series with a, a physical switch or breaker uh, that's represented in the bottom left-hand corner. And then in the event that, uh, that the opening of that physical switch to allow the device to cool down following a fault event, uh, is problematic for the uh, for the the load side of the fault current limiter. We can often install the fault current limiter in parallel with a uh, reactor, shown on the right hand side of the screen. Um, so let's uh, let's walk through how this would work. During normal operation, uh, current flows through the superconductor and through the closed switch. Uh, and again, so you have zero resistance, zero inductance to the system. It basically just looks like a closed uh, breaker. However, uh, when a fault occurs on the system, the current through the superconductor becomes too high and the superconductor essentially becomes uh, uh, like an open switch. It, uh, it becomes so highly resistive that the current that is trying to flow into that fault is now pushed through the, re the resistance of the, uh, of the other metals in the superconductor wire and that parallel reactor. So this is the state where the fault current limiter is actively reducing the fault current uh, contributed to the fault. After uh, a few cycles, um, five to six cycles, 
the breaker uh, that is in series with the fault current limiter will open and will stop the current flowing through the uh, metals in the superconductor wire. Uh, this is now the state where the superconductor fault current limiter has no current flowing through it. So it's now starting its cool down period, but, but current is still flowing through the load through that parallel reactor. Uh, that parallel reactor will now cause a bit of a voltage drop and, and uh, it's not an ideal situation. Uh, you wouldn't want to run continuously uh, with the reactor in, in series. Uh, but during this five minute time where the fault current limiter is, uh, is cooling off, you are seeing uninterrupted uh, service to the load uh, on the other side of the fault current limiter. So this mode uh, operates for about uh, five minutes. The fault current limiter cools down and then automatically the fault current limiter returns to its original state. Um, so after the five minutes passes, the, uh, fit the breaker is automatically closed again and we go back to the original state. So no, no operator interference, no, um, no need for anyone to go to site, no parts to, to change, nothing like that. Uh, you have a just this five minute period and then we go back to where we were. Uh, so I think I'll hand it back over to Arnaud uh, to talk a little bit more about some of the, the technical characteristics of the fault current limiter. Thank you, Mike. So now we have seen, uh, before we've seen the function of the, of the fault current limiter, now we will have a look more to the how it looks like. So the the art of the of the um, free phase uh, fault current limiter is for uh, is uh, indeed the stacking of uh, of uh, uh, the coil that will uh, that will uh, be uh, made of uh, superconducting tape. Here you see the free cryostat, and the approximate size is around nine by three feet um, square, and. After we add some uh, uh, some auxiliary uh, before we add the cooling system, and we increase the footprint to uh, by two uh, uh, wider system. And once we have add the cool the full cooling system, then we we increase another times by two uh, by having the enclosure and and associating the cooling system to the to the full current limiter. So it's it's quite a simple ar architecture. Uh, with the different stacking of, of uh, giving the, the different function of the uh, of the uh, fault current limiter with this uh, auxiliary uh, system. Next, please. So typically, we are in the range of voltage of around six to thirty-six kV, uh, so a medium voltage area. Uh, with frequency um, uh, from sixteen. Uh, 77, which is railways indeed, and after up to the frequency in the US 60 Hertz. And also it works in DC because it is a resistive uh, uh, fault current limiter, so it works also for DC. The current range are going up to, uh, are starting at few hundreds uh, amps and are going up to five kilo amps. And we can have different cooling options depending on the site configuration and the accessibility of the site, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, propose different uh, cooling system indeed. Huh? And we can adjust at the beginning, so the customer is giving us uh, what are the wishes uh, according to the limitation, and we adjust uh, uh, by design the, uh, the level of fault current. So uh, the system is, is all the time monitored to be sure that we are uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right uh, state. And, uh, and also, uh, for sure, uh, also installation, commission, training and service are, are part of the, of the supply of such a system. So uh, now we go even inside. So indeed, we have a stacking. So it's a very simple uh, principle. Huh? We are putting in series such a pancake uh, to, uh, to have the current we put them in parallel and, and to have the voltage we stack them so we put them in series so it is indeed a selfie configuration that means you are you are a spiral with one tape going up to the center and coming back so indeed 
uh, that's why we have no inductance and it is it is necessary for to be invisible uh, uh, to the grid and uh, indeed here inside this uh, this uh, 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 spiral you have in parallel the uh, um, superconductor uh, tape so coating uh, and the resistive uh, parallel path to that will take the current once uh, uh, superconducting uh, will be uh, will disappear the, during fault so you see it's it's straightforward and now if we look at the <coughs> real uh, starting from the tape so uh, here you see one example of the coil of the pancake and we are stacking such a pancake <coughs> to reach uh, so each coil each pancake is able to manage a certain level of voltage and current and by stacking indeed we are coming to the required level of current and voltage for the for the full system so we have uh, what we call a module that is introduced in the prior stat and uh, after uh, as we have seen uh, uh, before we are adding all the other auxiliary system to uh, to make the system uh, uh, running uh, with the right uh, um, cool, cool, cool condition and also uh, all the communication with the SCADA to, to give the state and also to command the trigger of the breaker to, to stay to say uh, uh, to the to the breaker uh, when to open uh, uh, once we start uh, uh, when the, the after the fold starts. So indeed, we already installed several uh, such equipment uh, uh, in Europe. So uh, in Germany, uh, with uh, with a project in Essen, on Pacity. Also, uh, we uh, Vattenfall, where we installed it, it was an industrial uh, um, private network uh, uh, with uh, Western Power Distribution in UK, where it was a network, and Andesa as well, it was a, a distribution network. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Arnaud. Um, if anyone uh, in the audience has uh, uh, interest in this technology, uh, within North America, uh, please feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, there's my uh, email address. And then for uh, Europe and, and the rest of the world, uh, please feel free to contact Nexans. And uh, together we will uh, work to, to develop a, uh, a solution that will hopefully be helpful to you. Um, and then from there, I think we can go into uh, the question and answer session. Paul? Yes, hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks, uh, Arno, for, for the great presentation. Maybe I'll just ask a question to get the questions rolling. And um, I see this as a great application, by the way, for industrial facilities looking to increase fault currents to maybe reduce voltage drops. Uh, I see it in mine applications in South America as being something that, that somebody might use paper mills, steel mills all these types of facilities where voltage drop is often an issue and a weak power system is of concern. So um, the physical, the physical um, breaker or switching device that's in series with this, de this device, um, is that, does that reset based on temperature or time? What's the, the typical reset no. of that? It's, a, it's based on, uh, on time. Um, so a, a calculation is made to determine um, how long it needs to be open is typically uh, around five minutes, uh, and uh, and then the automatic controls of the uh, FCL uh, will uh, will uh, order that uh, switch to to close back in uh, once that time has elapsed. Yeah, and the current's flowing through before that switch opens. The current's flowing through the the semiconducting semiconducting material, superconducting material, not semiconducting, superconducting material. Is, is that a significant amount of current at that point? Uh, that that breaker yeah. or switching device, what's it? It's interrupting yeah, some so, amount of current, right? Yeah, so the, uh, the you know, during normal operation, it can be rate, rated up to uh, uh, 5,000 amps. And then, uh, so that, so the breaker, of course, has to be rated to handle that uh, continuous current that the, the fault current limiter is rated. And then when the uh, when the faults on the system, uh, the amount of current that actually flows through that breaker uh, is dependent on the configuration. Um, so if there's a parallel reactor, uh, the amount of current will be quite a bit lower than if there's not a parallel reactor. Uh, but even in the in the worst case scenario, so say there's there's no uh, parallel reactor, uh, the fault current that flows through the the FCL 
is approximately double the rated current of the FCL. And uh, uh, through, through design modifications, that number can be, can be uh, customized. But, uh, so, but in general, it's a, approximately two times. So if it's a 3,000 amp rated FCL, uh, you'll see about 6,000 amps uh, through, the, uh, through the FCL during a, during a fault and then through the breaker. Uh, so a typical breaker that's rated at 3,000 amps, for example, can usually interrupt, um, I believe, a 12 uh, kiloamps is the kind of minimum current rating that you can buy. Uh, so it, it's a relatively inexpensive, relatively simple breaker, um, and we generally rely on our, our customer uh, to specify that breaker, typically so that it matches their existing equipment and it's a a make and model of breaker that's familiar to the uh, to the utility or the industrial customer. So, so it's just a standard, more or less a standard breaker, and and they're going to match it to the existing switchgear arrangement. If it's a, a certain brand breaker, they're going to put the same breaker in in that yeah. in that system also. That's right. We have no special requirements for speed or for um, full current limiting or anything like that. Most any breaker will do. And, and indeed, uh, the, the fact that it is a resistive uh, full current limiter makes the work easier for the, for the breaker because you are synchronizing the current and the tension. So it's, you have less energy to, to break. The, the, the arc energy is much less. So you, the wearing of the breaker itself is, is, is much less. It, it, I mean, at 15 kV, it's typical 31.5 kA breaker. 25 ka breaker, 40 ka breaker, 50 ka breaker. So you're you're saying two times the FCL rating. So that's that's five a, or ten thousand amps. It's, it's it's nothing to the breaker. Yeah, very very smart. Yeah, well, it's very interesting technology for sure. Um, I hope the uh, audience is popping in the questions, and we're going to go over to a question screen uh, and then come back uh, to answer questions. guys so hey we've got a lot of questions today um, I'm just gonna start right at the top and uh, I'll narrate the questions and if uh, Mike or Arnold if he could answer the question that'd be great so first question came in from Pierre and thank you everyone for asking the questions um, so Pierre asked the question how how uh, the system comes back in operation after a blackout so I will answer to that one. Indeed, we have a, we have a reserve of coal power, which is indeed a nitrogen tank, liquid nitrogen tank. So that means all the control system is on battery. So even if we have no uh, no electricity from the network, we continue to uh, to control the temperature. And if there is a blackout, and even after fault, uh, uh, we are still keeping the control of temperature through the reserve of coal we have in this uh, nitrogen tank. Okay. Uh, another question came in, uh, in, in T and D transmission distribution, we tend to trip close very quickly, uh, sometimes three times open, reclose type operations. Uh, how can we, how can your system achieve this? Yeah, for, uh, reclosing, uh, events, uh, the, in, in such situations where you're likely to be exposed to reclosing events. Uh, we'll use that parallel reactor approach that uh, that I discussed, where uh, you have this reactor in parallel with the device. Uh, so if the FCL, after limiting that first uh, waveform of, uh, of current and, and several waveforms, the breaker will open, will let the uh, let the FCL to cool off, but then this reactor will be in, in, put into, into the system. And so when it recloses, if it recloses back into the fault, you'll now have that reactor there uh, already in the system to help limit the fault current. Uh, and then once the, uh, the whole series is complete, after about five minutes or so, then the, the system automatically goes back into its original configuration. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, next question. How does uh, current flow in other path and resulting losses affect the temperature or life of the superconductor? The, uh, the system is designed um, to handle the maximum expected fault current and, and duration of that fault current, uh, breaker clearing times, and, and so on. Um, so it's designed not to be um, 
and, you know, to absorb that energy uh, during those faults uh, without damage to the wire or the, uh, the material itself. Um, the wire is, is um, designed to be able to handle um, these changes in temperature within the wire without um, uh, damaging the wire. All right. So it's a, a system design uh, parameter. That's what it comes down to. All right. Thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, so Majid has a couple questions. His first question is, uh, do you have uh, modeling blocks and standard study software like ETAP, PSSE, PSCAD, and so forth? I will answer to that one. So we start to have some modeling blocks because we are more and more case, so we can uh, start to have uh, some uh, 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 some blocks. Indeed, the, the, the basic principle uh, up to now is to use building blocks of the software because uh, what is a fault current limiter? This is a variable resistance with the power dissipated in the in the in the fault current limiter. So as soon as you are able to uh, to uh, count the when you the, the fault start, you count the energy dissipated in the in the fault. We have uh, we can provide the curve of increase of resistance with this uh, energy. So there is two way. Uh, at the moment it's more uh, it's more uh, uh, tailored approach, uh, but the basics is the same. We can provide the the variation of the resistance with the with the power dissipated in the fault current. Yeah. And on the EMSC side, um, we, we have a, a T&D planning group uh, that works with our customers that are interested in these products and we can uh, support the modeling efforts. Uh, just to jump on what Arnaud was saying, the, the uh, phase domain type softwares like uh, PSSE or PSLF, uh, the models are very, very simple. It's just a, um, a uh, short you know, a, a, a zero impedance line in parallel with a reactor or, or a breaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're very, very simple. In the time domain world, uh, EMTP um, and uh, PSCAD and so on, uh, the models are, are significantly more, more complicated because they're trying to take into account what's happening during the first uh, milliseconds of the, of the event. And uh, in those cases, uh, the approach that Arno described is used in the modeling. But we can certainly uh, work with our customers, make sure they have the right models and are applying them properly. Yep. All right, the second question from Majid was, uh, what's the voltage range of the product? I think, yeah, uh, what uh, usually we go up to 36 kV. We are limiting ourselves to 36 kV, but there is no lower lower limit. It's Usually it's around just 10 kV to uh, uh, up to 36 kV at the moment. But the, indeed, uh, uh, we never have a case uh, at a lower voltage, lower than 10 kV, but it's it's feasible. It's, uh, there is no issue. In no frequency, right? It could be, can it be DC, AC, uh, uh, 60 it, hertz, it, right? It, it, it works in all for all frequency, indeed, because it is a resist, resistive for current limiter. So it's not linked to the frequency at all. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, uh, when uh, when neutral and phase FCL units are deployed, how is uh, how is it synchronized uh, times between the neutral and the phase is ensured? Sure. So that that question is probably implying that um, we're talking about single phase uh, type uh, applications. The the vast majority of the applications that we're looking at are are within substations, uh, so they're three phase um, applications. Um, but, but in general, the, there's no controls or there's no switching uh, involved in the, in the fundamental operation of the device. It simply sees a certain amount of current going through the material, and if that uh, current exceeds what the, what the superconducting material can handle, it becomes resistive. So there's, there's no need for active um, uh, synchronizing and, and so on um, in the vast majority of applications that I can think of. Okay, a couple of questions from uh, Hamish or H. A. Mish. Uh, Protection-wise, how do you configure your relays and perform the relay coordination? Right. So, so again, we're we're mostly in substations. Um, so you're primarily using a differential style protection. Um, so you know, as you look at the device, you make sure that the current going into the uh, protection range equals the current coming out of the protection range. And uh, the FCL will not uh, interfere at all with uh, differential style uh, protective approaches. Uh, for distance or impedance um, type type relays, uh, you know we're usually not on a line uh, with an FCL that would um, 
that would use a distance or impedance type relay. But if we were, uh, there would need to be some coordination between the relay and the FCL. The, the relays are making the assumption that the impedance of the line does not change, uh, but the fundamental purpose of the FCL is to change impedance during faults. So there, there are um, uh, considerations that need to be taken if, if the FCL is within a differential, sorry, an impedance relay zone. Uh, but like I say, the, the vast majority of the protection approaches used for a device like this in a substation would be a differential protection and, and those work just as they would normally. All right. And there was one follow-up question is, what is the maximum length uh, at different voltage levels? Can it be used in long distances? Yeah, I think, um, so we also do uh, fault current limiting uh, uh, superconductor cables. Um, our uh, uh, resilient electric grid, grid product. Uh, we just actually um, installed a unit in Chicago, which is actually a, uh, a superconductor cable that comes in various lengths and, and has various applications. And I believe there's a, well, I know there's a previous tech talk um, talking about, um, about that technology and, and the project in, in ComEd. But this device is a, a standalone uh, device. Uh, it's a uh, I think it's a, a three meters by two meters kind of kind of footprint, um, and uh, it, it's independent of um, you know lengths of, of the cables and things surrounding the device. Okay, next question is uh, how do you bridge the gap between the superconductor and the non-superconducting materials? Which uh, losses do you put into consideration between these two layers? I can answer that one. Indeed, um, um, Mike explain you that we have a switch between the two layers, but indeed they are, they are next to each other. They are, they are in contact, in very close contact, and it is very important for the fault current limiters that the non-superconducting and the superconducting layer are very close, um, because indeed it makes uh, the transition of the superconductor very homogeneous, because as soon as you reach a, a, a temperature which is around 80 K, so you have a transition of the superconductor uh, um, and then you have a current which is slowing in the non-superconducting and you are finishing indeed the, the quenching. And, and so if this is the basic of the, of the, of the, um, uh, the way the full current limiter is, is, is functioning, is, is operating, you need to have this increase of temperature to, to trigger the, to trigger the, uh, the limitation. So it is not a drawback, it is made for that. All right, thanks Arnold. Um, next question is, do you have reliability data which could be disclosed? I think we have a FCL at the moment in Europe, which is in operation uh, since seven years now. So uh, no, no issue up to now. Okay, uh, is the product uh, already been a CSA approved North American market? in Canada. Uh, we, uh, we've bid projects into uh, Canada to meet uh, uh, the, the Canadian standards. Uh, the product is generally uh, manufactured to uh, I, uh, I, IEC um, standards, so there is an IEC standard for uh, superconducting fault current limiters that's, uh, that's out there. Uh, we generally uh, uh, comply with that standard. Uh, there are some safety-related aspects to become compliant with the CSA that can be done uh, with an on-site inspection. So we, we certainly, if we're selling a unit into Canada, uh, we would include um, certification to CSA standards as part of that uh, part of that order. So probably like a field inspection, the same thing you do for what we do for our custom filter banks is uh, is a field inspection. They have somebody comes out to site and field inspects. Yeah. Okay. Mainly around grounding and things like that. Yep, got it. Um, okay, could you uh, give us more details regarding yeah. economical justification of the uh, economic justification the uh, economic justification of the, F of the SSCL? Yeah, absolutely. So so the, the place where this makes sense is, is places where um, some of the uh, other ways of dealing with fault current. So for example, um, uh, splitting up your substation or installing series reactors, uh, where those types of, uh, of applications or, or approaches are not appropriate. So the, the, the classic one is that uh, you have a substation, you're serving a secondary network, um, 
in, a, in an urban area and that secondary network isn't going to respond well with splitting the bus or adding impedance within the bus to, to manage fault current in a more, more traditional way. Uh, so you have this strong desire to keep everything tied together, but if you, um, uh, you know, to get the fault current too high, uh, the cost of replacing all of the breakers, and then the, the bigger issue is actually downstream of the substation, the customer-owned uh, equipment. So if you add a transformer, you add a transmission line into a substation, that causes the fault current to, to rise. Yes, it's going to be very expensive to change out all your your 40 kA breakers to 62 kA breakers or or whatever or whatever you need to do, but sometimes it's not even possible to to re-rate um, everything that's connected to the system, in particular the, the customer uh, customer owned uh, equipment. So you're stuck in a, in a situation where you need to find a way to deal with this uh, this fault current situation. Uh, but the only way to to deal with that would be to have a big hit on reliability or flexibility of operation or, or something like that. So those are the scenarios where, where this product is really going to be um, is really valuable. So it's it's usually major substations um, on the utility grid or uh, substations on the industrial world where you're going to add uh, a cogeneration plant or you're adding a transformer to serve your, your plant and the, the fault current rise is just going to be so uh, expensive to, to replace all the breakers, not to mention the uh, impact on your processes to replace all those breakers. Uh, this can make a lot, lot of sense and be, be very cost effective. And then the, the final application is in the renewable world uh, where you're the, the developer of the large renewable facility uh, is on the hook for all upgrades to the grid. Um, so if they're going to install a large installation that's going to impact the fault current on the utility grid and uh, the, the um, integration process requires the utility to evaluate that and figure out what the cost is of those upgrades uh, because of the, the new facility, uh, it's a pretty straightforward to look at a fault current limiting solution as an alternative and see if you can save the costs of the utility upgrades by installing a fault current limiter with your with your renewable installation. So uh, the the applications are generally um, you know large systems, uh, large substations, generally urban. Uh, and in those scenarios, it can be so expensive to solve a fault current problem any other way uh, that the fault current limiter approach uh, makes tremendous sense. Great. And one last question is, uh, is uh, projected life based on the number of events or years? So life expectancy. I can take that one. Indeed, uh, in that case, like for, for superconducting cable, we don't have uh, aging like uh, organic material because we are at so low temperature that indeed uh, you, you will not have any aging of the, of the dielectric, uh, solid dielectric inside. So it's it's usually the lifetime is more the number of of, uh, of cycle. That means when you have to warm up. But indeed, such a system has the peculiarity to be able to be maintained without without stopping. That means you don't need to uh, to stop the uh, uh, the system to maintain the the the, the cryogenic uh, uh, cooling system. Huh? This is the only part which has to be maintained. So, um, so indeed, uh, the lifetime is, uh, is, is uh, there is no real limit, indeed. Uh, and even if you have, uh, what is also very good with such a system, that you can dismantle them completely. Nothing is, is glued or something like that. So if you have an issue, you can repair it and, and replace only a tiny wire and just, uh, and just uh, reclose everything, recool down and, and just go ahead. Okay, there's another follow-up question, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's, what is the lifespan of the SFCL compared to other conducting materials? Maybe, there's, maybe they're talking about other superconducting materials, I'm not sure. Apologies if we mentioned this before, so. Uh, we're gonna find the SFCL compared to, to, to the other. Uh, yeah, just uh, answer, I think, or did I miss something? Um, yeah. I think, I, I think you covered it. Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, what is the effect of a uh, series of short circuits in a short period of time? Oh, so uh, again, uh, that, that's similar to the idea of a, of a reclosing where you have a, a, a fault that occurs, you clear that fault and then reclose into it a short period of time later. 
Uh, again, depending on the, the configuration of the device, um, we would either be uh, out, of the out of the circuit completely, so that reclosing event wouldn't uh, send current through the, the fault current limiter, or we would have the parallel reactor component um, switched in, and then that would manage the, um, the rapid uh, events or the follow-on events. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just, just to mention something really quick, just in case people are thinking about it, the, um, the, one of the real advantages of the superconducting fault current limiter is that it, uh, it is able to limit that first half cycle uh, of the fault current, when that, which is where most of the damage is done. So the, the first half cycle of the fault current is the, the, the peak uh, instantaneous current where you get uh, uh, torquing in your, in your breakers and in your bus bars. That, that's what really does all the damage is that first half cycle. And that's where this product really shines is that it's able to limit immediately that, that first cycle. Uh, unlike uh, approaches like a, um, a reactor in parallel with a with a breaker, where you open the breaker uh, when you sense a fault, uh, th those breaker clearing times are five or six cycles. Um, so during, before that breaker opens, um, all that fault current has already passed through it um, and, and has damaged the equipment. Whereas this is, for all practical purposes, instantaneous in its speed of operation uh, to limit that fault current. And then, of course, the other major advantage is that after the event, uh, it automatically, without any operator or manual uh, intervention, puts itself back online uh, and, and just continues to run as it did. Uh, so, so those are the things that really make this different from the other things that are out there to limit fault current. Okay, question came up on routine maintenance. Maybe you want to comment on what the routine maintenance might look like. I can answer to that one. So typically at the moment, the, the circulation system for nitrogen, they are at the level of every maintenance every two years. But now there are some systems which have been developed where the maintenance is only every five years. So 40,000 40, hours, I think it's around, it's around uh, five years. Okay. So we're, we're just about getting close to the end of the presentation. Um, please, everybody, do remember that uh, if you are looking for a PDA certificate, uh, professional development contact hours, just send an email to myself or to Matt. Uh, we gave that email at the beginning of the presentation, paul.sedgick at nepsi.com. And um, if you are interested in talking more about FCL, feel free to reach out to Arnold or uh, to Mike, uh, and they will be happy to uh, work with you and answer your questions. And we do have one more question that came in before we end here, uh, if, you got, if you don't mind. Um, are the high and low temperature SFCL products both available in Nexan? Ah, uh, I don't, the one we are developing now is, is only high temperature uh, uh, superconductor. Okay. All right, good. And uh, the code for the PDA certificates, I forgot to mention. Let's, let's use the code FCL. Makes sense, FCL. So we'll do F FCL. Uh, full current limiter is what you. Yes. Yep. That's for the um, for PDA certificates. Well, if somebody wants a PDA certificate, uh, just send us an email. Say that you watched the video, and uh, ah, okay. let us know <laughs> that you, you you heard that FCL code at the end, and we'll we'll get your a PDA certificate. Okay. So uh, full current limiter. Yeah. S is for superconducting yeah. full current limiter. I'll put, we can make it Sweet. SFCL. <laughs> so, uh, so Arnold and Mike, thank you for coming on today, and uh, we look forward to have you back on a Tech Talk in the future. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye -bye. See you.